one. You are going to hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to seven. Rita speaking. What should I do for you? Oh hi. I'd like to order some stationery. Could I know your name? Jackson Paris. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, Jackson? Sure. The number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four double one, right? And you're from Rainbow Computer? No, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, Jackson? Envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila? We'll have the plain white, please. But the ones with the little windows. Okay, one box, A4, white. Just one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make those two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, Jackson? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets on the pack. Let me see. We're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. Anything else that we can help you with? Let me think. What else do we need? I'm sure there was something else. Ends, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. That's all right. I'm not paying anyway. Right, floppy disks. What about diaries next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. No, I think we're all right for diaries, but something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then with the other stuff? Just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But would you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after eleven thirty a.m. because we have to go out at twelve? There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine, I'll make a note in the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past eleven. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a job interview. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Please sit down, Mr Wilson. My name's Jane Smith and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to talk about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in evening news? It is evening news, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2002. Is that right? Yes, uh, 2002. Then I was unemployed for about two months. And then I travelled round Britain for a few weeks. So it must be more than three years now, in fact. Um, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change your job? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting. The salary is OK, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted, so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. My colleagues are quite nice to go along with, so there's a good cooperative atmosphere. And compared to other presses, the working conditions are great. I mean, the office itself is good. Um, yes. And then there's the fact that as a journalist, I regularly write articles about what is happening at home or in the world. So I have to make decisions. I must be responsible for what I have written. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. They give me lots of room for initiative. Yes. Well, we're looking for someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. I often work irregular hours. I was very often made to work at night. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Hi John, are you nearly ready? Oh no, I don't think I'm going to make it tonight. Why? I've got this assignment to finish for tomorrow. Well, maybe I can help. What do you have to do? I have to do a short presentation on some household object. and I just can't think of anything. I have to talk about what it is and the parts in it. Well, why not make it simple? Why not describe a bottle or a can? Well, that's far too simple. OK, how about an aerosol can? Hmm, maybe. What labels can you put on it? First you'd have to draw an aerosol can. First thing you could label would be the hairspray or whatever was in the can. You'd just label that product, I suppose. Then you'd have to label the area above the product as the propellant. Is that the gas that presses down on the contents of the can, forcing it out through the dip tube? Yes, you've got it. OK. So far, so good. Now, at the top of the aerosol, there are quite a few things to label, so I'd have to write quite small. Unless you drew a couple of lines and showed an enlarged picture of that area. Yes. 
That would work. Then I could start labelling from the top to the bottom. The first thing on the enlargement would be the nozzle. The what? The nozzle. You know, N-O-Z-Z-L-E. Then the seal. Right. Then all I'd need is the spring. No, you'd need to label the inlet first. Then the final part would be the spring. Anyway, that's it. You've finished. We can go out now. Well, I have to type all that into the computer first and draw the can. Oh! That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, my name is Emiliano. I am a student here and I'd like to rent a house for six months. OK, well you've come to the right place. We specialise in short-term rental. First of all, I would like to get a few details from you. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, it is Emiliano Nespla. And can you tell me your present address, please? Yes, it's 17 Middle Way, Penrose. I'm living with a homestay family at the moment. That's great. Now, do you have any identification with you? Oh, and we will need a reference from someone who knows you here. Maybe your homestay family. Yes, OK. Here's my passport and a card from my language school. My reference can be Mrs. Alice Thompson. She's my homestay mother and she would mind, I'm sure. You can contact her at the same address as me, of course. OK. If we need to contact you, should we leave a message with your homestay? No, you can speak to me directly. My cell phone number is 021-548-3534. Great. Now, do you have a bank account? You will need to pay your rent by direct debit. You know, it will come out of your account automatically every month. OK, I don't have my bank account details with me now but I can get them and bring them back later today. That's fine. Now, can you tell me what kind of house you are looking for? Do you want to rent by yourself? No, I'm looking for a three-bedroom house. I want to rent with my two friends. I will bring them in to see you later today. OK. And what areas are you interested in renting in? Well, here's a map. Can you see my school? I don't have a car, so I need to take some kind of public transport to school and I don't want to travel for more than 30 minutes each way. Do you think you have anything which is suitable? Yes, we do. Here is a list of available properties. I'll highlight the ones that could be of interest to you. Look at the map and go and have a look at the houses with your friends. Do you have a friend with a car? Yes, I do. Good. So go and look outside the houses. It will give you an idea of what the area is like. But remember, don't go into the garden or knock on the door. If you want to go in and have a look, let me know and we can arrange an appointment. OK. Can you give me an idea of price? Yes. If you look at the list, you can see the weekly rent written next to the house address. Oh, yes. I can see it now. Do I need to pay anything else? Yes, you need to pay a deposit which you will get back when you move out and you have to pay a non-refundable agent fee which is equivalent to one week's rent. You will have to pay your bills when they come in every month too, of course. OK, well, thank you very much for your help. What time should I come back with my friends and my bank details? How about 2.30 this afternoon? That sounds good. Thank you for your help. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming in. Goodbye.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Hey, don't throw that can away. Why not? I've finished with it. Yes, but you can recycle things like that. Oh, I haven't got time to recycle everything I throw away. That's a terrible attitude. Don't you care about... Hello, you two. Hi, John. What are you arguing about? Oh, Sam says he doesn't have time to recycle. What do you think? Well, I agree that it can be difficult sometimes. Do you always recycle everything then, Mary? Yes, I think everyone should. I mean, look at the state of the planet. If we don't all start making an effort now, it could be too late. Well, one of the reasons I don't recycle as often as I should is that I don't really know where to go. There are no recycling facilities near me. Well, I know I said I haven't got time, but actually there is a bottle bank near the supermarket just up the road. So I suppose there are limited local facilities. So you can do your recycling outside the supermarket? Yes, but like I said, only limited. It's only a bottle bank. Well, I don't have a car, so it's very difficult for me, but I still do it. Sometimes a friend comes over and we take our recycling together, but not very often. So if your facilities are limited, then mine are very limited. Well, I suppose if you go to all that trouble, I might make more of an effort. Good. If it was up to me, I'd encourage more people to recycle. How? Well, how about some kind of incentive? A reward for anyone who makes an effort to recycle. That's a good idea. But if you think everyone should recycle, then why not penalise those who don't recycle instead of giving something to people that do? If there was a fine for anyone caught throwing recyclable materials in the rubbish, people would take more notice. Well, now you're going too far. Do you really want anyone going through your rubbish just to check if you're following the rules? No, I don't think fines are a good idea. Well, I think we should be doing something. Anyway, I have to go. I've got my social science class next. See you later. Yeah, see you later. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about dust storms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. In the last lecture, we looked at the adverse effects of desert dust on global climate. Today, we're going to examine more closely what causes dust storms and what other effects they can have. As you know, dust storms have always been a feature of desert climates, but what we want to focus on today is the extent to which human activity is causing them. And it's this trend that I want to look at, because it has wide-ranging implications. So, what are these human activities? Well, there are two main types that affect the wind erosion process, and thus the frequency of dust storms. There are activities that break up naturally wind-resistant surfaces, such as off-road vehicle use and construction. And there are those that remove protective vegetation cover from soils, for example, mainly farming and drainage. In many cases, the two effects occur simultaneously, which adds to the problem. 
Let's look at some real examples and see what I'm talking about. Perhaps the best known example of agricultural impact on desert dust is the creation of the USA's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The dramatic rise in the number of dust storms during the latter part of that decade was the result of farmers mismanaging their land. In fact, choking dust storms became so commonplace that the decade became known as the Dirty Thirties. Researchers observed a similar but more prolonged increase in dustiness in West Africa between the 1960s and the 1980s, when the frequency of the storms rose to 80 a year, and the dust was so thick that visibility was reduced to a thousand meters. This was a hazard to pilots and road users. In places like Arizona, the most dangerous dust clouds are those generated by dry thunderstorms. Here, this type of storm is so common that the problem inspired officials to develop an alert system to warn people of oncoming thunderstorms. When this dust is deposited, it causes all sorts of problems for machine operators. It can penetrate the smallest nooks and crannies and play havoc with the way things operate because most of the dust is made up of quartz, which is very hard. Another example. The concentration of dust originating from the Sahara has risen steadily since the mid-1960s. This increase in wind erosion has coincided with a prolonged drought which has gripped the Sahara's southern fringe. Drought is commonly associated with an increase in dust raising activity, but it's actually caused by low rainfall which results in vegetation dying off. In the second part, the speaker talks about the drying up of the Aral Sea. Look at questions 37 to 40 and complete the flowchart. One of the foremost examples of modern human-induced environmental degradation is the drying up of the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Its ecological demise dates from the 1950s, when intensive irrigation began in the then Central Asian republics of the USSR. This produced a dramatic decline in the volume of water entering the sea from its two major tributaries. In 1960, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world, but since that time it has lost two-thirds of its volume. Its surface area has halved, and its water level has dropped by more than 216 metres. A knock-on effect of this ecological disaster has been the release of significant new sources of wind-blown material, as the water level has dropped. And the problems don't stop there. The salinity of the lake has increased so that it is now virtually the same as seawater. This means that the material that is blown from the dry bed of the Aral Sea is highly saline. Scientists believe it is adversely affecting crops around the sea because salts are toxic to plants. This shows that dust storms have numerous consequences beyond their effects on climate both for the workings of environmental systems and for people living in drylands. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.